you know, I think you all would agree that uh, ever since this pandemic broke, it's been kind of a, <clears throat> a well, unusual times to say the least. But all the things that we experience in this life has to be teaching us something. You know, we can't be just muddling through life with all the uh, problems that we have to endure. If nothing else, it is telling us that this life is not to be our home. And it certainly is a time of proving, so but we should look forward to our long home because that's when we can uh, achieve that rest that's been promised to the faithful. Here in uh, chapter 11, of course, it, uh, excuse me, I have to get my glasses out here. <laughs> that's just to make the, the rest of you feel better. <laughs> said, uh, it starts off and you open your doors of Lebanon. And Lebanon is the place through which uh, the, um, it's, it's kind of the north of Jerusalem. So it's kind of the place where the invading nations would come. They would come from the north. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour, devour your cedars. And of course, Lebanon was well known for cedars. Well, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. Cyprus was considered a lesser, less valuable tree than the cedar. So even those that are less valuable are wailing for the loss of the cedars. And because the uh, mighty trees are ruined, well, O Oaks of Bashan, uh, for the thick forest, that's the thick forest of Lebanon. And the way I understand it is that along the... Uh, uh, Jordan River, that uh, there were thick groves and what have you. And used to have lions in that area that, of course, they don't anymore, and that's where they would dwell. So uh, these thick forests, that's what, that's what they're talking about. This is the sound of wailing shepherds, for their glory is in ruin. The sound of roaring lions and the pride of uh, Jordan. pride of Jordan is the thickets is in ruins. Now the shepherds, oh, why would shepherds be wailing? Well, if the uh, <clears throat> these invading armies come down and they uh, destroy the cedars and the cypress and what have you, they also destroy the grazing for the sheep. <clears throat> so they give the occasion for the <clears throat> for the shepherds to uh, be wailing also. Now here in verse 4, it says, uh, this says the Lord my God, feed the flock for slaughter. And uh, I suppose that it, he's telling the prophet here to feed the flock for slaughter. But if this is also may be uh, uh, messianic. In fact, you, you get this latter part of Zechariah, and it is uh, messianic. Feed the uh, flock for slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds uh, do not uh, pity them. Now, who are their owners? And, you know, the sheep usually talking about the flock, usually talking about the faithful. Or the uh, the, the uh, people of uh, Jerusalem and Judah and so forth. So the owners may be the foreign owners, and they did own them for for a while. <clears throat> and they uh, elevated their own sense of self-importance, saying that you know they must be blessed of God because they conquered these lands. Uh, else, why would they? be the conquerors if God hadn't blessed them. Had a little understanding that uh, God <clears throat> uses these evil nations for his own purposes. He says in verse 6, For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the, the land, says the Lord, but indeed I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of his king, 
and they shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. Now, certainly there's something happening in this land. But what land are they talking about here? What land is that? Because you're talking about really a number of different uh, nations, different kings and so forth. And they're going to attack the land. They're talking about the people of the land, but it's just, it could be anywhere. And uh, again, you know, we talked about, you know, the heathen nations will rise up and punish. Uh, God will use them to punish his people. But then other heathen nations will also rise up and punish the heathen nations. So uh, these world powers here uh, that being alluded to here, world powers will destroy world powers. That's always been the case. And as time goes on, we'll find out that's going to continue to be the case. You know, we in the United States seem to think that we were always the uh, world power, but we weren't. It's been a very recent uh, phenomenon. And whether it continues or not, it depends on a number of factors. But anyway... <clears throat> So, uh, he's looking at verse 4. Looking at verse 7, you have to refer, refer to verse 4. So, I fed the flock for slaughter, in particular the poor of the flock. Now, we keep in mind the poor of the flock because that's going to be uh, mentioned a little later. Uh, in particular, the poor of the flock. And I took my, for myself two staffs, one I call beauty. And beauty is can be translated grace or favor. I... I took one staff called beauty and the other are called bonds. If you're, maybe King James may say bands, I'm not sure, bands. But that has to do with a unity or a, a unity and a brotherhood, if you want to think of it that way. And uh, these staffs, of course, uh, shepherds use staffs to kind of control the sheep, get them to where they need to go and so forth. And I dim dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. There have been many commentators that try to figure out who these three shepherds were, and we really don't know. But if it's the uh, if it's the uh, uh, unfaithful, they certainly didn't like the shepherd. And they abhorred the shepherd that you know tried to get them to do right, but that's not certain as to what that really uh, you know the three shepherds. But you can also uh, say that if the shepherds are bad, the sheep are going to be bad. So whatever rulers you may have, if they're bad. Whatever organization it is, I don't care if it's a corporation, a nation, state, or a church. If the shepherds are bad, then quite naturally the organization itself is going to be bad. So he said, I took my staff of beauty. And remember, that's favor and, or uh, grace. Or, he said, I cut it in two. It's no longer going to be grace that I might break the covenant which I had made uh, with the peoples. So it was broken on that day. Thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Interesting note that the rich of the flock did notice. But the poor of the flock who were not encumbered by the, I guess, the riches of this world could see that it was uh, the work of the Lord. It was the word of the Lord uh, and they, uh, uh, well, they agreed that it was. Verse 12, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Of course, you go over in the, uh, the gospel account according to Matthew. Jesus uses this to, well, this was actually the wages, if you want to call it wages, that, Judas received. And uh, here it says, and, in, and the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price. 
Yeah. And that's ridicule, that princely price they set on thee. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now this 30 pieces of silver, that's the uh, <clears throat> uh, price of a gourd ox. It was, it's a very, it, it's almost an affront uh, to the person that's asking for the wages. And it was an affront that Judas Iscariot would take just 30 pieces of silver for the life of uh, Jesus himself. And and the potter a potter is a uh, well a potter is a potter <laughs> you know pottery makes pottery and they use a lot of pottery but uh, pottery was a very fragile uh, utensil and a lot of it was uh, broken in the process of making and of course during the process of using it was also broken and they would throw it out and what they call a potter's field, which is just waste. So uh, that's probably how this idea came across that, you know, you, if it's a, uh, if, if it's an affront, the pavement is a front, you know, you throw it somewhere where it, it's a, a sort of a waste potter's field. Give it to the potter. Then he says, I cut in two my other staff, bonds, or brotherhood, or unity, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So it's no longer going to be, uh, there's something going to happen. When, when this happens, the uh, brotherhood of Judah and Israel is no longer going to exist. And he, he looked towards the Messianic age, and indeed, the division between Israel and Judah disappeared. It was only, you still found Jews, but uh, of course the church primarily became a uh, Gentile church. And of course the uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. So that bond of brotherhood between the two is going to be broken. In 15, the Lord said to me, Next, take for yourself... Uh, the implements of a foolish shepherd. Now, what is a foolish shepherd? Well, the one doesn't tend to his duties. He's just uh, indifferent to the care of, of the uh, sheep. And he says, for, for indeed I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear the hooves and pieces. This shepherd is only concerned about himself. He's not concerned about the sheep at all. In verse 17 is a woe to this worthless shepherd. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock. A sword shall be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither. And his blind, eye, his right eye shall be totally blinded. This means that this is actually, these physical things are actually going to happen to the shepherd. But it kind of paints a picture that this worthless shepherd, who doesn't tend to his duties, is indifferent to the uh, care of the flock, is going to be uh, bad to him. He's going to have to suffer judgment. This is an indication of judgment upon this uh, indifferent uh, shepherd. This one doesn't tend to the uh, stewardship that he was uh, dealt. In verse 12, again we have this, uh, the burden of the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord against Israel. That's a load that Israel is going to have to carry. Thus says the Lord, again, that's uh, used quite often, Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Well, this is the uh, creative nature and the uh, uh, sustaining nature of, of God himself. 
He both created the heavens. He, um, he laid the foundation there, and he sustains them, as it says in the New Testament, by by his word. And he forms the spirit of man within him. While he's still forming the spirit of man within him, or as the case may be, girl, <laughs> he forms their spirit. He breathes into every uh, human being their spirit. And of course, uh, once that's done, that spirit will always exist in one place or the other. So he's still doing that. He said, Behold, I will make a Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the peoples. All who would heave it away will be sure to cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Now, is this talking about the uh, siege of Jerusalem, in Judah and Jerusalem? Uh, you know, when you're talking about a cup of drunkenness, you know, you know that, that makes people crazy. Uh, so Jerusalem is going to be make these nations that uh, surround it and lay siege to it. It's going to make them kind of crazy, like a drunk person would be. But is this talking about physical Jerusalem? It's probably talking about spiritual Jerusalem. And at the church, you know, that's going to make uh, people seem like drunken people. And that's going to be a heavy stone for all the uh, peoples, all the heathen peoples, because it's going to oppose them. And the church, the true church, is going to, to win. Now, we know the physical Jerusalem was completely destroyed, so it's it, uh, not likely that he's talking about the physical Jerusalem. That's going to be destroyed. And the, the, the gospel is going to be that heavy stone, and it's going to cut all these heathens into pieces. It's going to enroad, make inroads in their uh, system, their worldview, and it's going to change them. So it's going to be a heavy stone, and they're not going to be able to heave it away. In that day, in verse 4, that's the day that he's talking about before, and when you see in that day, and then subsequently you see another in that day, it's talking about the in that, in that day before. Just what he got through talking about. Is in that day, so in that day, when you know uh, Jerusalem is going to be laid siege and so forth. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and his riders with madness. I'll open my eyes on the house of Judah and will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And of course, remember, horses are uh, instru instruments of war. So. Uh, people that have waged war against this uh, heavenly Jerusalem are not going to prevail. It's going to seem like their horses are uh, confused and the riders are mad. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength, and the Lord of hosts, their God, and that day, again, what he just got to talking about, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pile. That's fire pan holds the ashes, holds the fire. And uh, like a fiery torch in the sheaves, they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left hand. That's everybody. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. Well, in the destruction of Jerusalem, it's not going to occupy its own place. So it's, it's uh, again, likely referring to the, the heavenly Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem. And the governors, uh, when they say in their heart, 
The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the house and the Lord of hosts, their God. And the governors of Jerusalem are the, are the uh, leaders. And when this uh, heavenly Jerusalem is inhabited, uh, they are going to say that the leaders, that the uh, uh that the people uh, inhabiting the spiritual Jerusalem are going to be their strength. In verse 7, the uh, Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Jerusalem. So these are all going to be, uh, there's not going to be one superior to the other. And... Uh, whether in tents or in the cities, they're all going to be uh, treated alike. And that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the one who's feeble among them that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's the spirit of Jerusalem. But David himself is not going to be uh, oh, uh, become alive again. So it can't be talking about the uh, physical David. And David, or the house, the physical house of David is not going to be like God. And the angel of the Lord, uh, or like the angel of the Lord before them, a lot of times when you talk about the angel of the Lord, you talk about one of the uh, Godhead. Uh, so this has to be uh, talking about what was promised that the uh, the Christ was going to come through the lineage of David. And this, the house that Jesus built is going to be uh, uh, God-like. Now, I'm not talking about uh, what people consider to be the church. I'm talking about the, the true spiritual church. That's going to be the house of David, and it's going to be uh, godlike. In verse 10, well, it, it says the uh, it, it's going to destroy, uh, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against uh Jerusalem, you're talking about spiritual Jerusalem. The church is going to prevail. It will not be able to be destroyed. In verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then will they look upon me whom they have pierced. And you go over to John 19, chapter, verses 37. It talks about Jesus being pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for the firstborn. Uh, certainly this is messianic. It's talking about Jesus and when Jesus was pierced in the side, you remember, and uh, out came blood and water. It said, in that day, when he was pierced, in that day there shall be a great morning in Jerusalem like the morning at uh, Hadad Rimmon on the plain of Megiddo and that's thought to be uh, the place where Josiah was uh, killed and the land shall mourn every family by itself and the family of the house of David by itself and he goes through a number of uh, both individuals and uh, institutions that are going to mourn and certainly once the people realized what they had done to Jesus, you know, you, you remember on uh, Pentecost, where they uh, were convinced that they had actually uh, killed the Christ. And so they did mourn. And verse 13, chapter 13. In that day, again, referring to what happened before, 
that day a fa fountain shall be opened for the house of David. And this fountain is the uh, coming from the one that was pierced, which is blood. The fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And this is what was going to uh, expiate sin and uncleanness, that is the blood of Christ. That was going to, to cleanse them. And it shall be in that day, again, for in the, what went on previously, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the uh, idols, or the names of the idols from the land. And again, this certainly can't mean of the heathen nations, but they continue to have idols. But when we're talking about the, the land or the spiritual uh, Judah, there are not going to be any idols there. And if there's any, any church that has idols, and there are some, they can't be the uh, true spiritual church. And they shall no longer uh, be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Now, the land, again, if you're talking about spiritual uh, Judah or Jerusalem, there's going to come a time where there's no need for prophets. The church does not need prophets. Now, when did uh, the prophets... Uh, cease. Well, we know that you know the gospel is given part and parcel, but when it was complete, there there's no longer a need for uh, prophets. Now, there are a number of prophets that are named in the New Testament. Uh, of course, Jesus was called a prophet, and uh, a number, that'd be a good uh, exercise on your part. Go through the New Testament and find out all the people who were called prophets. Now, there are a lot of number of false prophets, but those that were true prophets, you know, go through the New Testament and uh, come up with the names of all those that were prophets. Like I say, Jesus was a prophet. And uh, there's some women that are named prophets, uh, called prophets. Can you, can you name those? So, now... Why is it that the church no longer needs uh, prophets? Well, because we have a completed uh, New Testament. We don't need anybody to foretell anything. We don't need anyone to foretell anything. But we do need plenty of people to retell what the Word says. So, a re now, that's not selling stuff. I'm talking about retelling. Those that are retelling are, are those that uh, preach the word. He said, It shall come to pass that anyone still prophesies in his father and mother who begot him will say to him, You shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of uh, the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall th thrust him through when he prophesies. Now, this probably doesn't mean a literal thrusting through. Even in the Old Testament, there is uh, two occasions that I know of, probably more, but if you had uh, a son or a daughter that tried to entice you to, to worship uh, idols, someone, something other than the living God, then the uh, parents were to uh, report them, if you will, and then the people were to stone them. But the parents didn't do it. Now, if you had a uh, child that was unruly, disobedient, and so forth, then, uh, well, I think, I think the case was if they tried to entice you to worship other gods and the parents would kill them but if they were just unruly and couldn't get them to obey and they would report them to the uh, 
in essence, the elders of the Jews. And then the Jews would stone them to death, but the parents wouldn't. So uh, in this case, this is a um, indication of that that prophecy is going to cease. And if, if uh, any time later somebody says that they're a prophet, and there are some today that say they are prophets, or they're false prophets, they're not real prophets. And if they had lived back this time, uh, this time it had been fairly bad for them. And it shall be in that day in verse 4 again, the thing that was just spoken of, that every prophet shall be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive. You know, some prophets did wear coarse hair. And, and, but now they're not going to do that. But he will say, I am no prophet. I am a farmer, for a man taught me to keep cattle for my youth. Now this is one who did say he was a prophet up here. And then he was caught. And then he says, well, I'm not really a prophet. I'm just, I'm just a farmer. And I just, man taught me to keep cattle. And uh, that's, that's why I have this rough uh, clothing on. And someone will say to him, what are these wounds in your hands? And he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Not certain what this is, but it could be that if he were uh, uh, given over to you know, what some of these prophets do, he could have hurt himself in the process. And then maybe that maybe that's uh, the wounds that he's talking about. In verse uh, seven, he says, "Awake, O sword, against my shepherd." Now, a sword doesn't necessarily mean a physical sword, but it's just an indication of of uh, death. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against my man who is my companion says the Lord of hosts. And of course this is a, a messianic in, in nature. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And this was uh, quoted by Jesus to his apostles that when, once he was uh, uh, killed on the cross and they're going to scatter. Now, it's interesting that uh, the way that he phrases this, awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Now this is, uh, he says it's a man, but it's the same essence as, as uh, God himself. And it is, you know, before Jesus came, uh, you know, through uh, Mary, he was the exact same essence as God, and that's an interesting study in itself. You know, what it was like before he became a man, but once he did become a man, he was still just as much uh, God as he was before. He still had the same essence. Now, how they decided that back in the uh, it's hard to say that in the beginning because that caters to the uh, our human way of thinking. But it says in the beginning, God. Well, it hadn't have already been decided at the time of creation. Everything that was that was going to happen throughout the ages, that was already determined and decided. How did they do that? I don't know, but they did it. <laughs> And like I say, you, there is no beginning to God. It was just that the creative power of God was in the beginning. So, you know, what we now call the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were of one essence in the beginning. When, but they were one essence before the beginning because there's all, they've always been there. That's hard for a finite mind to comprehend, but... Uh, that's that's it, and it says. Uh, then I will turn my hand 
Uh, yeah, it says, strike the shepherd and the, tea, uh, the sheep will scatter. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Now this word against in the Hebrew can mean a whole lot of different things. And this use, uh, word is very, very common in the Old Testament. Uh, it's used more than um, 5,000 times, a whole lot of times. And I think the King James ASV, the, they said of saying against, it may say upon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All that, you can tell, at least we can tell, some people can't tell, that uh, if anybody uh, asserts that there's still demon possession today or prophets today, like our apostles today, you know, I told you to go look in the New Testament for all the uh, names of the people are called apostles. Yeah, they're, I'll just give you another hint that the apostles themselves were not called apostles, I mean the prophets, but they were prophets. Because what, what's one of the gifts of the uh, uh, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy. And the apostles had them all. So they were prophets too. But there are other prophets' names, so go, go look for those. But uh, anybody that claims that they're apostles, prophets, or uh, witch doctors, or what are you going to call it, they're lying to you. They may believe it, but they're lying. Yeah, that's what he said. He, he, he quoted this by himself when he uh, was about to go to the cross. He told his apostles or disciples at the time. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, so we'll start verse 8 uh, next time.